loud enough? Should I do it again? Yeah, you're good. <laughs> Are you sure I can do it again? <laughs> you're good. <laughs> The Economic Development and Small Business Subcommittee on Housing will come to order. Would the clerk please take attendance? Chair Coleman, Majority Vice Chair Diefendorf. Here. Representative Stone. Here. Scott. Here. Andrews. Here. Grant. Present. Cernoglu. Here. Aragona. Here. Zorn. Here. Fink. Here. DeBoyer. Here. Chair Diefendorf, you have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minority Vice Chair Representative Aragona <laughs> moves to adopt the minutes from the meeting on May 11. Thank you. The meetings, meeting minutes from May 11 are adopted. Next, we will hear a presentation from Carleen Lehman, Property Management Association of Michigan, uh, Forest Wall, Apartment Association of Michigan, Erica Farley, Rental Property Owners Association, John Lindley, Manufactured Housing Association, and Brad Ward, Michigan Realtors. Whoever would like to go first, please proceed. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Brad Ward. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Legal Affairs for the Michigan Realtors. Um, I don't know, I, I, I can call people up kind of after. Um, I know that I think the I, intent was to save questions until the end when all of us present, but I'm happy to take questions after, after I'm done. Uh, we are the state's largest trade association. We represent over 35,000 members across 40 local realtor associations uh, in Michigan. Our members come from every part of the industry, uh, residential and commercial brokers and salespersons. We have real estate appraisers, property managers, developers, builders, title company members, uh, mortgage professionals, uh, and many of our members also happen to be mom and pop landlords that own one or two rental units. We are truly Michigan's real estate experts. We are at a critical point for housing in Michigan. I don't have to tell you that. We've had many presentations over the last few weeks in this committee that have, uh, have, have um, restated that fact over and over. Demand is far outpacing supply. We are facing limited availability and affordability like never before. We appreciate the focus the legislature has brought to housing over the past year, appropriations toward improving our existing housing stock, building new units, putting more tools in the toolbox for private industry and local governments to work together to create additional housing options, um, and also, for the first time, creating legislative committees uh, that are specifically focused on housing. Over the past five years, Michigan home prices have increased 7.1%. Construction continues to lag behind our historic long-term averages particularly in the Detroit metropolitan area. In 2005, over 50,000 12-month building permits were pulled in the state of Michigan. As recently as October of last year, uh, we had only 20,000 12-month building permits. And I know from my friends at the Home Builders that they are projecting single-family permits to be in the neighborhood of $15,000 or 15,000 15, units uh, this year. Reducing inventory and supply have put pressure on sales and the rental market. However, Michigan has a lot to be proud of. We are also a national home ownership leader uh, with a rate that far outpaces the average United States, which is 73.3% home ownership rate here in Michigan uh, versus a 65.5% home ownership rate in the United States. We also outpace US averages minority home ownership as well. This year, our association is pursuing policies that will promote more housing development and protect homeowners, private property rights, and the environment. Our issues of availability and affordability were not created overnight, and unfortunately, they aren't going to be solved overnight. You've taken important steps as a legislature in appropriating money and passing laws to spur development, but in many areas, it's still difficult to get a shovel in the ground. For a lot of the talk surrounding our housing crisis and the need for more housing, nimbyism and recalcitrant local zoning continue to be impediments to our housing needs. We need to find a way to overcome this. Other states like California, Florida, Washington, and Colorado have taken the approach of forcing developments upon local government. Our current position as an association is that we need to incentivize and reward locals that change their zoning, their master plans to accommodate more housing. We need to rethink the way we approach development in this state, and it starts with education and communication with our citizens. 
In addition, we are working on legislation um, that has either been introduced or on the verge of being introduced to increase the number of splits available under the Land Division Act, require that all real estate licensees receive annual fair housing education, eliminate a predatory practice of creating 40-year right to list uh, sales agreements. We also would like to promote the use of post-closing occupancy agreements and real estate sales. And we would like to pursue a statewide septic code that allows for alternative systems that promote better land use and more housing density. I cannot stress enough the importance of expanding our housing ecosystem to include all forms of housing, owner occupied and rental, market levels uh, that need to meet the current needs of our citizens, our future citizens, and our economy. So thank you very much. And again, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. Thank you for your presentation. If we could have the next presenter and uh, let us return to questions when all testimony is completed. Certainly. Uh, Erica Farley, I believe, is the next one. Or, and then Forrest Wall. OK. There you go. Good morning. My name is Erica Farley, and I am the new executive director for the Rental Property Owners Association of Michigan. I'd like to thank the chair and committee members for allowing me to speak this morning. The RPOAM was founded more than 20 years ago for property providers of single family properties throughout the state of Michigan and works to advance the commercial and economic principles of the rental property and real estate investment industry in Michigan. Currently, the RPOAM represents more than 2,000 members throughout the state. The goal of the association is to provide representation and resources for property owners so they are able to provide the best possible homes for their residents. As active members of their communities and small business owners, members of the RPOAM work daily to ensure that individuals and families who live in the properties have safe and comfortable homes. Our members are also a resource for residents who are in need of assistance staying in their residence. There are many examples of RPOAM members and residents working together to keep families in their chosen homes. Individuals having stable housing benefits, everyone, and is important to the community as a whole, including the property providers. We are continuing to work with committee members and legislators dealing with uh, legislation in this industry and trying to make sure that it works for both the people who provide the housing and those who live in it. So I am happy to answer any questions as we move forward for the day and continue to working with all of you. I'm gonna let Forrest and Carlene talk. Good morning. Uh, Chairperson Devendorf, members of the committee, thank you so much for hearing from all of us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to address you. Uh, my name is Forrest Wall. I am the CEO of the Apartment Association of Michigan. Uh, we're a trade association that represents apartment owners, um, multifamily builders, as well as industry suppliers. And while that you know, one line describes our organization and, and, and the members, it doesn't tell you who our members are. And so I'm going to start my comments out with a little bit more information about who our members are and then get into some of the supply issues. Um, so to start, our, our board of directors is made up of owners of Michigan-based companies, uh, many of whom are multi-generational, family-run small businesses. Our members are your neighbors. They give back to their communities and they're deeply involved in their charitable endeavors. But most of all, they take their responsibility and their profession of providing housing for individuals and families very seriously. I think at least one member of this committee is a, uh, is a, is a rental property owner, um, but I'm pretty sure that at least most of you probably either know of somebody in your family or you have an acquaintance who's a, who's a rental property owner. Uh, this is an industry that's dominated by individual investors and small businesses. This point's illustrated by the 2021 Rental Housing Finance Survey, which was conducted by HUD and the Census Bureau. According to that survey, 70% of all apartment properties in the United States are owned by individual investors. 
Our members are also a key part of the economic engine that drives our state. A healthy rental housing industry is crucial to state and local economic development efforts and to attract and retain businesses in our state. That's because business owners carefully analyze the availability of workforce, but then they also look at where that workforce will live when they're making a business decision about relocation or expansion. The rental property industry employs thousands, both directly in the form of leasing, maintenance, and other staff, and indirectly with supplier employment. Our members value the work ethic and the dedication, the individuals who work in property management, of, of the individuals who work in property management, and those who take care of the resident needs on a daily basis. Rental housing is the linchpin to ensuring a healthy housing market in the state. Why is that? It's because whether you are a family, a college student, somebody who's utilizing needed housing assistance, an individual who's new to Michigan for a job, or whatever stage in life, housing provides you with options. Rental housing provides you with options. Um, it's a viable long-term housing solution for you, or it can be a shorter-term option on a pathway to home ownership. It's often the attainable solution in the housing market today. But in order to keep it attainable, we need to have a focus on increasing the supply of all types of rental housing in Michigan. According to a study by the National Multifamily Housing Council and the National Apartment Association, the United States needs to build 4.3 million more apartments by 20, 2035 to meet the high demand for rental housing. Here in Michigan, that same study estimates we need to produce 48,000 apartment units just in larger rental structures that they define as five plus units. So that doesn't even include the smaller structures. I'm sure all of you have seen the targets in MISHTA's statewide housing plan, which calls for a minimum of 75,000 new or rehabilitated housing units over the next five years. This data and the other studies all come to the same conclusion. We're severely undersupplied as it relates to rental housing, and we have to work to create an environment where more rental housing can be built. Increasing our new rental housing supply will not only help with the issue of attainability, but it also has significant employment and tax benefits for the state and local governments. According to the National Association of Home Builders, construction of 100 rental units supports 125 jobs, and it generates almost $5.6 million in taxes. When you scale that up to the thousands of rental units we need to build, you can see the significant impact it will have on our state and local government tax revenue as well as employment. But beyond the tax and the job implications, rental housing is an important part of the fabric of our local communities. Multifamily housing helps to create vibrant, walkable communities. Our members are investing heavily in the construction of new buildings, as well as the rehabilitation of existing structures in our urban communities, which act as catalysts for additional development. As an organization, we're working hard to inform the public and policymakers on the need for more rental housing. But we're also working every day to elevate the professionalism in the industry by educating our members. We provide educational opportunities on many things, such as fair housing law, MISHTA development opportunities, energy efficiency, and other important topics. Our members and their hardworking staffs value this training because they believe learning never ends, but also because it helps them to take care of their residents better. Let me close by stating how appreciative our organization is with the attention our legislative leaders are giving to the importance of housing attainability. The Apartment Association of Michigan stands ready and willing to work with you on these issues. It's so fundamentally important for the people of the state of Michigan and for our economic future. All Michiganders deserve a safe and affordable place to call home. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Now I'll turn it over to Carlene. Good morning, Represent Representative uh, Devendorf and committee members. I am Carlene Lehman of Princeton Enterprises and a Property Management of Michigan Association board member. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to introduce our organization. Property Management Association of Michigan, or PMAM, uh, provides homes for nearly 222,000 Michigan families and voters. The Property Management Association of Michigan we, uh, is the largest statewide association for the multifamily housing industry. Our membership consists of regional chapters including West Michigan, Mid Michigan, Detroit Metro, and uh, Washtenaw. PMAM belongs to the National Apartment Association. 
We focus on the day-to-day -day management uh, issues which affect the quality of life and rents of your constituents. Forrest has given you um, statistics um, which I agree with, the PMAM agrees with everything he said. I'm going to spend a little time talking to you about um, some of the realities of what property management companies and their many, many employees go through. Uh, PMAM advocates for all issues affecting multifamily housing, including resident safety, information security, inspection practices, and fair housing. We support proposed laws that will not unnecessarily limit the availability of high quality, affordable housing without any corresponding benefit to the public. My personal history is very stereotypical in our industry. Um, first of all, it incurred it occurred unintentionally, completely. Um, uh, directly out of school at age 22, I was hired by a developer and uh, started, he developed apartment communities. He also had an arm, a uh, management arm of his company and they were short staffed at one point. So I moved over just for a very short, short period of time. I found managing apartments to be extremely hard work, but I found that I, I liked the service industry very much, and here I am 112 years later, never, never having left that industry. Property management jobs contribute to Michigan's economy by providing entry-level positions, skilled positions, and executive-level jobs. Apartment on-the-job training allows entry-level unskilled maintenance to apprentice under licensed trades, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, etc as a gateway trajectory into higher trades. We work with local colleges to uh, train interns who receive college credit in their field of choice. Entry-level leasing consultant jobs can promote into assistant manager, property manager, or even corporate employees. While the norm is shorter-term residency, our industry, and shorter by shorter-term, three to five years. Our industry also has many residents who live in their apartments for 20 plus years. In fact, I frequently am told, we are told by residents that it's their apartment now, we no longer own it. However, they don't seem to take the tax bill. Property management companies do our best to serve residents and build a strong sense of community. One property manager I work with became a mentor for children at risk. Um, Gerard and his husband are foster parents. He is stylishly dressed, uh, the most professional man, and has become almost a Pied Piper for um, preteens and teens at his apartment community. I don't know how he does it. When I walk the grounds, he knows so many residents by name, and it is a 400 plus unit property, meaning that there's probably 1,200, uh, 1,500 residents there. He asks children about school issues and acts as a sounding board. Students are encouraged to bring their test results and their report cards to the main office. Outstanding school achievements or improvements are rewarded with pool parties. Gerard and his staff also tutor on the danger of gangs and how convictions may affect their future, uh, their futures and their future potential. Parents thank Gerard and the office staff constantly for being a second encouraging voice. Apartments work hard to build communities that may otherwise be lacking in busy lives. We offer treats to the, uh, those on their daily dog walks. We build bark parks to encourage socialization. Residents may receive breakfast on the go bags as they leave for work in the morning, have ice cream treats brought to them at the pool on hot days, movie nights on the tennis courts on very large inflatable screens. Uh, receive spaghetti dinners the night before Thanksgiving while they're busy prepping the next day's feast. We promote local businesses by bringing food trucks to the properties. It is standard practice for Santa to visit children near the holidays and for trunk or treat to occur on Halloween. We shamelessly solicit vendor donations to provide school supplies to families in August. Several school districts offer summer lunch programs for food insecure children. We always offer refrigeration and distribute the lunches for them. If a resident falls behind in rent, we provide a list of short-term and long-term rental assistance options in the hopes of keeping them in their apartment. 
apartment communities also give residents and staff an opportunity to be philanthropic by coordinating charity coat drives, food drives, school backpack drives, toys for tots, etc. Property and corporate staffs receive annual fair housing training to ensure all understand equal rights in federal, state, and local protected classes. We educate residents on how to ask for a reasonable accommodation or modification so disabled persons may enjoy their apartment equally with others. We um, are fully versed in educate residents on VAWA laws as well as Michigan Senior Independent Law. In closing, management companies work hard to provide housing for your constituents. It's a challenging but very rewarding profession. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today, and our organization is always available to discuss housing issues or leg uh, pending legislation. Thank you very much. checking my watch to make sure it's still morning before I say good morning and sound like a book. Uh, good morning, members of the uh, House Economic Development Small Business Subcommittee on Housing. My name is John Lindley. I'm the President and CEO of the Michigan Manufactured Housing Association. Uh, thank you for inviting us here today and providing us with the opportunity to testify. I want to express my appreciation to the Speaker and House leadership for creating this special subcommittee on housing. Our state's Ongoing housing and supply, supply and affordability crisis in particular deserves an all-hands-on-deck response, and I commend the, the Michigan House for recognizing the importance of this issue. The Michigan Manufactured Housing Association is composed of roughly 650 members representing the entire supply chain of factory-built housing. Those that build the homes, the modular manufactured homes, those that transport and install the homes, and of course the community owners across the state. A significant factor in addressing Michigan's needs comes in the form of home ownership opportunities. Attainable home ownership is critical for many reasons, and affordability is especially important because it can help people escape poverty and give more citizens the best chance and success on life. Manufactured and modular homes are a popular option for many Michigan families. You'll find these homes in rural, suburban, and urban areas and communities across our state. In fact, Michigan ranks in the top 10 states every year for receiving manufactured home shipments, and the metropolitan Detroit area in particular is one of the top 10 retail markets in our country for manufactured housing every year. We believe the manufactured and modular homes can play an even larger role, however, to help end our state's housing crisis. Unfortunately, there are some barriers that exist, both real and imagined, that limit people's access to these affordable homes. Let's first address the issue of quality. It's vitally important to realize that manufactured homes use the same building materials as site-built houses, but with one distinct and important advantage. Manufactured homes are constructed, constructed excuse me, in an efficient, climate-controlled environment, away from the elements and in a streamlined building process designed to reduce waste and keep costs low. In fact, today's modern facilities are so efficient that they can build a home in two weeks, and so with so little waste left over, it would not fill a 55-gallon drum. Since 1976, construction of these homes has been regulated by stringent federal laws and rules ensuring their quality under the umbrella of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. The appearance of modern manufactured homes and modular homes is also compatible with local architecture and can often be essentially indistinguishable from site-built homes. Easy for me to say. Construction also is continually inspected to ensure manufactured homes meet the standards of HUD code and modular homes meet the standards of the state of Michigan residential building code. The same code used for site-built homes in our state. In addition, each home is engineered and inspected to meet a wide variety of safety standards and energy efficient requirements. Cities, suburbs, and rural areas in Michigan are facing the same affordable housing crisis as the rest of the country, and it's one driven, frankly, by a lack of affordable options. New manufactured and modular homes start at less than $75,000, with many financing options available. The average new manufactured home price is just over $100,000, which is three times less than the cost of an average site-built home. Further, previously owned and occupied homes are available in beautiful, clean, and safe communities all over the state for less than $40,000 or $30,000. I mentioned an all-hands-on-deck approach. We need multifamily housing. We need rental homes, apartments, condos, duplexes, neighborhoods. We need it all, and we need manufactured and modular homes. 
The Manufactured Housing Association is fully supportive of Governor Whitmer's efforts to end our housing crisis. We stand ready to work with the legislature and the governor's administration to achieve the goals laid out in the administrative administration's statewide housing plan. The goal which we share is to make tens of thousands of new homes available for Michigan families over the next few years to address this crisis, a goal that frankly will not be met without consideration of manufactured and modular homes. Michigan's manufactured housing industry is helping reach the governor's goal by providing thousands of new homes for families every year, even through the height of the pandemic. For example, the manufactured housing industry provided 12,404 new homes in Michigan since January of 2020 despite too many local governments standing in the way of development of these critically needed housing options. The simple truth is that the single largest deterrent to affordable housing like manufactured homes is a local government's residential zoning restrictions. Planning and zoning regulations have been used by local, government, local units of government to create and defend solely zones of higher cost housing commercial um, areas, but they have rarely been used to provide tools to promote widespread affordability. Even more troubling, sometimes zoning restrictions specifically exclude manufactured homes in a local community, ensuring that people wishing to live in that community will force to pay artificially high prices for no reason. Discriminatory government restrictions on the housing supply will only exacerbate our current crisis. Manufactured homes provide affordable home ownership opportunities for thousands and thousands, roughly 250,000 Michiganders. The best thing the state can do to spark even more of this kind of growth is to incentivize local governments to embrace pro-growth pro zoning policies to attract more housing options for the people who want to live here. Again, we need an all-of-the-above solution. In order to drive toward our shared overlapping goals of addressing affordability and increasing the supply, we should consider uh, reforming zoning restrictions to help our state grow, increase home ownership equity across race, race, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups, and increase home ownership among low and middle income households. That's how we build a state where everyone can live and thrive. We can all agree that state and local policies should be aimed at setting Michigan up for long-term growth and success, and certainly we have always been a place where people can afford to live, work, and raise a family. Now more than ever, Michigan needs affordable housing to help people fulfill the dream of attainable home ownership, and the Michigan Manufactured Housing Association is deeply committed to turning that dream into a reality. We're hoping to work with all of you to build a better future for all of our communities. Um, with that, I have concluded, I think we've all concluded our testimony, so I just welcome my colleagues back up here and make ourselves available to any questions to the panel. Thank you for your presentations. They were all very informative and very timely. And actually, Mr. Lindley, if we could start with you. <laughs> Hello again. Um, I, I'll start with the first question first. Thank you, everybody, for your comprehensive approach to our housing crisis. We certainly agree that this will take a, require a multi-layered approach um, that ensures that folks have access to housing, can remain in housing, and that we develop more fair processes for eviction um, and for keeping people in their homes if we can avoid eviction. And with that, Mr. Limley, could you clarify or describe to us the eviction process for somebody who is in a manufactured home but on rented land and have any and give us any recommendations for how that process could be made more fair? Um, I wish that I was in a position to better and more detailed describe that eviction process. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. And I've always been told in my 20 plus years of doing this that um, I will follow up with you is, is, a, is a, a fair answer to a question. Um, I can tell you that it is a complicated process. Um, my members um, will tell me that that un requires at least two trips to court at that, you know, at that point in time before an eviction takes place. Um, and that largely is in recognition of, of the, the, when the individual owns their home but leases the land that it sits on. Um, I will gladly follow up with you and every member of the panel with a one pager that bullet points exactly what that process is so that you can see it in writing if that's fair. I look forward to those conversations. We had some fruitful conversations in our office yesterday and it does sound like it can be an excruciating and painful process and one that makes it um, difficult to stay in the home that you own. So we will follow up later. Um, Representative Fink. Thanks. I think that they put me here to discourage me from asking as many questions as I'm inclined to because I have to 
<laughs> move one of my colleagues to get to the microphone, <laughs> but it didn't work. Um, my question is also for Mr. Lindley. It seems to me that one of the advantages that your indus the industry that you're here representing offers is that there's not any community in the state that doesn't have some, you know, place where the the products that your members offer would fit. Is that do you understand my question? I mean, like you, you get what I'm getting at. Whether it's rural, small town, developed city, there's some place where either uh, manufactured or modular housing could be a part of the solution to the aged and limited housing stock that we have. Is that, a, is that one of the advantages you see for your industry? Absolutely. Um, I think w one of the things that you're touching on there is the, the, the diversity of the, of the industries that we represent, the ability to, to place homes, whether in a community, about 75% of the, the manufactured homes that, that are bound for Michigan um, or are built in Michigan are bound for a, a licensed manufactured housing community. About 25% are bound for private land. They're used for infilling in more urban areas, et cetera. So yes, absolutely. The diversity of the product line um, can, from the, from the westernmost uh, the part of the UP all the way down to you know to southeast Michigan, there is a spot for for manufactured and, and modular homes in in the state. Among the other benefits, I will say, is the speed to market right now in the crisis that we have, the ability for those homes to be um, produced and manufactured at a very fi fast rate. Representative Andrews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also for Mr. Lindley. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're up to bat. Um, for um, for a long time, home ownership has been um, the path to generational wealth for a lot of uh, individuals um, and communities. And currently, home ownership be becoming harder and harder to be an attainable um, asset for many communities and individuals is sort of precluding that path to building wealth. Uh, I'm curious if you have any stats on uh, modular and manufactured homes as people are uh, obviously much cheaper to manufacture and own. Do you see the uh, appreciable value in both of those assets? Is that something that helps build towards you know future home ownership? Yeah, and absolutely. Thank you for that great question. That's actually one of the kind of the age-old um, misconceptions that, that we're, we're trying to, to battle. And I actually have some data that I would be more than happy to, to share with everybody. Taking nothing away from, from our friends with multifamily housing and partner and rental units across the state, um, getting people eventually to the point where they may, if they choose to, you know, want to create some home ownership and, and some equity in something um, is, is a pathway that, that we often want to see people on. Um, manufactured homes, current modern manufactured homes, um, do appreciate in value when they're cared for, just like our, our, our friends in, in, in you know, the site-built um, housing industry. Um, they're not generally attached to, to the real estate, to the land, so they're not going to appreciate at the same rate, of course. That's just kind of basic economics, but they do appreciate in the value. They do provide the opportunity for that resident to gain some equity in something, which may ultimately result in you know, the down payment on that next rung on the housing ladder. Absolutely. Representative Aragona. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Lindley, kind of to bounce off of Rep. Andrew's question, um, we had had some some pretty, yeah, I don't know why you guys are up here. I mean, it's just John. No. He's doing great. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, we had had a previous conversation regarding uh, interest rates. Um, and I know I know the bankers are here, and, and if they want to follow up with me, but if, if any of you guys, I guess, can a a uh, answer this question, I know that interest rates on owning a manufactured home are higher um, than a conventional mortgage. So is there any type of lending tools? Is there anything that we might be able to do? Don't run away, Patricia. Where are you going? <laughs> um, is there any type of, of lending tools or anything that we can do um, to help with that in order to lower that, that monthly payment. Um, it, it, you know, if I go out and get a conventional mortgage, my, my percentage is going to be lower, ergo my monthly payment is going to be lower. That's a little harder on, on the manufacturing side. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I absolutely can. So, so a manufactured home is, is, is treated as personal property, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's what you may have heard of as a, as a chattel loan is, is what it is. So, you know, people don't... Um, qualify for a traditional mortgage in a manufactured housing community. So with that comes a certain level of, of a higher risk amount. And the financial institutions, of course, recognize that higher risk amount, and that results in a higher interest rate. Um, that's the reality of it. So to answer your question, 
we are committed to as an industry and as an association, and we would sit at any table that's having any discussion at any point in time about financing options and what um, changes and growth and reform could be done to help residents uh, obtain lower interest rates in, in our products uh, relative to, to more tr traditional mortgages. Um, I believe there are solutions that we could come up with. Um, but there is, there's a larger risk faction, uh, factor there that, that has to be recognized. But how we can deal with that, I'm, I know that there's creative solutions we come I think Brad had something to add. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add on, uh, for those manufactured homes that are placed on individual parcels of property, last year the legislature uh, took action and the governor signed into law uh, an expedited process where you can combine the title of the personal property, the mobile home, with the real property, uh, which allows you to apply for all of those government-backed conventional uh, mortgages, uh, which was a very uh, real hurdle that we faced uh, for a number of years in Michigan was, especially on the older manufactured homes that were on individual parcels, locating and identifying the 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 title to the manufactured home itself, um, because you needed that to do the certificate uh, of, of affidavit, of a, affidavit of a fixture. Thank you, John. Um, but we did take important steps that will allow people to apply for those homes located outside of the communities um, to be able to combine uh, the titles and, and receive those lower, more conventional rates. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and that makes sense. And, and, you know, like I said, to Rep. Andrew's point, if this is an, an appreciating asset, you think, yeah, I understand the, the blade of, or the, the, the problems that um, uh, a lender would have w with an asset, but if you can, if, if you know it's appreciating, that might help a little bit. I did not realize that legislation. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a freshman. Um, have you seen any, um, have you seen it being used? I know it's recent legislation, but have you seen it, it in use, and do you think it's helping with this issue? Yeah. Uh, so it's been used for a number of years in the state. Um, we had uh, a court case that stalled it for a period of time. Um, someone had sued the Secretary of State's office uh, over the affidavit of a fixture process and the issuance of new title. Um, but this legislation is very much in place, and people are using it to get those sales accomplished. Yes, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I you want one more? <laughs> um, Mr. Wall, you had uh, you threw out a figure of, of seventy five thousand um, homes that are needed. Can you help me better understand how we came to that number of seventy five thousand? The, the seventy five thousand number is actually Mishta's number. Uh, that's in their statewide housing plan, and it um, combines both um, single family residential re rental housing. It's a it's an estimate that they came up with over the next five years that they feel needs to be built to have uh, you know, a proper level of housing for our state. I would actually tell you, I, th I, th I think that estimate's probably a little low. Um, I, you know, I, I, I look at it from a market perspective. I mean, what, what we see on the single family housing side, um, the for sale housing as well as rental housing, um, I think that that number, when you look at some of the, the statistics nationwide, and, and they vary a little bit, but I, I think that number is probably a little bit low, especially as it relates to um, Mishta-backed, low-income type housing, subsidized housing. There, there's, there's a significant need there, and uh, we need to be building more. So that's actually Mishta's number, not that's the Home Builders Association. That's not, that's not our organization. Okay, number. thank you. Yep. Thank you, Representative. We're going to move on to the next questions. We have quite a few to before we close out. Representative Zorn. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, you know, everything we're, we're reading is that Michigan is losing population. So I, I question if we're losing population, why do we need more homes? Why are we so far behind in, in, in the home uh, arena? Well, it's, it's not just Michigan. I mean, it's, this is a nationwide uh, issue. Um, people are living differently. Uh, we have folks that, um, you know, uh, it, it's not uh, the traditional 
thought of single family living in a home anymore. It's multiple individuals spread across multiple units. We also have aging housing stock. We have significantly old housing stock in Michigan. Um, we went through uh, a period of years where we eliminated a lot of blight within our cities, which meant tearing down a lot of those blighted and, and uh, you know homes that weren't able to be occupied. Um, so it is a matter of housing stock that ages out. It's a matter of market options and not having enough supply at you know, certain price points, uh, certain uh, availability or, or what people would view as desirable. Um, and it's a matter of people kind of just living differently um, that we've, we've spread ourselves out a little bit more um, than we have traditionally. So, oh. Thank you for that. Representative Cernoglu. Okay. I was just going to ask um, where um, a majority or uh, some of the manufactured homes, are, are some of them made in Michigan or are they out of state or where are they coming from? For, for a long time, the, I wasn't able to say this, but the answer to that question is yes, we are manufacturing both HUD um, manufactured homes and modular homes in the state of Michigan. The majority of them are manufactured just over the border, northern Indiana, Elkhart County, et cetera. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you out of the hot seat. Mr. Lindley. Um, and if I could just sneak in a question here, uh, we are seeing difficulty, of course, with housing affordability and aging housing stock. And I think that we can all acknowledge we need to find a way to invest in keeping our housing stock um, livable. Uh, we're were somebody to get to the point of eviction um, at some point in their past, do you feel it would be reasonable to consider eviction expungement for folks who have past evictions? And do you know of any landlords that have used past evictions, um, even if expunged or, or um, long ago, in order to deny people housing? You want to start? We'll put the landlord expert up. <laughs> the, com uh, the company I work for has uh, 27,000 units. Um, so we're pretty well versed in this. Um, we actually have both a criminal override program as well as a, an eviction ex um, override program. And Things as HUD, in, in 2015, HUD uh, came out and stated that they wanted every landlord to take a look at their criminal criteria and loosen it, and they gave us some criteria. Princeton has, um, and, and not just Princeton, I'm speaking for um, PMAM because I uh, interact with many, many other landlords. Um, we, we all kind of chat with each other. Everyone I know has a criminal override program as well as an uh, expungement. Does that mean that they will accept someone who is currently being evicted owing $7,000? No, not always. Everything is looked at individually. Um, the, in, at Princeton, our program is both the criminal and the um, eviction expungement is handled by a, a, a person who doesn't see anything about this, uh, the individual. Not, not race, not age, et cetera. But we do um, take a look at when did this eviction happen? Did anything get paid off? Uh, and we, we welcome people. I think I would, I would add to that too from, a, from the association standpoint. I mean, we would be willing to look at, you know, legislation along those lines. We're always open to that conversation. We will make sure that you get language to look at. Thank you. Um, Representative DeBoyer. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting enough, enough I, I mean, I, I'm, as we're getting moving as a committee, I really think we are starting to sort this stuff out. Um, what I'm starting to recognize, uh, frankly, I've been in the industry for 30 years. Um, and really, I see two things happening here. We're, we're seeing there's an issue for, for rental availability for whatever those conditions are, uh, whether it be personal past history things or affordability, but we're also seeing affordability issues for single family housing and for the tier of stepping up single family housing, whether it be a newly, you know, wed couple moving up to, you know, a retirement home. Um, and I think that breaks down into three things on that category, which is uh, finance affordability, 
labor and material costs, and governmental regulations. I think if you narrow it down, it's, it, it, there, there's other things, but, but I think those are three biggies. And one of the things that I think is important, and, and Brad, if I can ask you, is what do you see that we could do in regard to the Zoning and Enabling Act? Um, because that's used a lot of times in communities to hide um, you know, maybe some personal intent on what a local community is trying to either create or discourage. Um, is there is there room in that act for modification and amendment that would contribute to to all facets of housing? Frankly, yeah, I I think you know uh, changes to zoning, project approval, uh, all of those, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, can be impediments to um, to building new housing and creating new housing and allow for missing middle housing options and things like that. Um, you know, there are things within zoning like. Lot size minimums, height restrictions, uh, design standards—you um, know, uh, those kind of things lend themselves to either keeping housing options out or adding to the cost of housing options because we don't get to share the land cost, right? We're not—we're not building densely. We have, you know, two-acre lot minimums, or we can't build over two stories. Um, so, you know, like I said, there are other states that have taken approaches where they've kind of forced this. Uh, in, into their local communities. We as an association believe that there are rooms for, uh, there's room for incentivizing that sort of behavior. In fact, in the House budget uh, that was passed, there's $5 million uh, that local governments can grab onto um, to help them redo their zoning, redo their master plan with an eye towards housing. Uh, the Michigan Association of Planning uh, put out uh, a publication recently um, that lists ways that uh, local governments can look at uh, their local zoning um, to, you know, try to make things uh, more friendly for housing availability, opportunity, uh, and affordability. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there are definitely things that, that we can do within the Zoning Enabling Act, um, and, and we're happy to have those discussions. Do you, incentive, if I may, Chair, incentives, I think, are important. If, if you had an example of how we would incentivize uh, every, everyone loves carrots more than sticks. Right. Um, and so, you know, whether that's additional revenue sharing, whether that's um, approaching uh, communities like we do sometimes with larger, uh, you know, um, employment opportunities, uh, where we say we're going to focus on a community and put money into a community to, to address uh, housing needs there. Um, I think those types of incentives uh, are available. I mean, the, the zoning um, and master plan grants uh, are, are small. Uh, obviously, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, changing behavior with, with those, but, but you start having that conversation um, and it fosters more ideas. Um, but I think in terms of, of incentives, I think we're talking about, you know, really looking at something that would be truly impactful to a local community, not just increasing the housing options there, uh, but also increasing the, the services and amenities that they can provide. Thank you. Would, would you say that just one simple quick one? Um, would you say that the interest rate moves that we've had recently, obviously, has caused somewhat of a gridlock of people that are locked in at 3% saying, you know, I'm not interested in putting it up unless you can give me a really big number? Um, it, it hasn't helped. Okay. Um, you know, and, and we uh, as an association have begun to look at uh, some of the supply side with the existing housing stock in terms of, you know, how do you encourage people to move? Because we don't just have the interest rate lock here in Michigan. We also have, you know, property taxes that are capped under Proposal A. So if you have, I'll use my parents as an example, um, you know, moved out of uh, the family home that we all moved out of uh, to downsize to a condo. Um, and they had to make that very real calculation between the interest rates and the expected property taxes, even though it was going to be a much smaller home that they were moving into, to make sure that the affordability numbers worked out for them. Um, so we do have some of those, those things that are incentives to, to stay put and stay in place. Um, ultimately, I think people look beyond numbers uh, and, and follow their heart in some of these these decisions when they when they decide to move uh, they face other um, practical issues like expanding family size and things like that um, but you know the interest rates uh, have not uh, have not helped um, but we also have kind of a perfect storm facing housing whether it's you know shortage of labor uh, as you pointed out material costs reliable supply chains uh, all of those lend themselves to kind of this uh, the, the, this crunch that we're, we're all feeling across the nation. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Oh, Can I also add to that, too, and, I, and this doesn't directly answer the question on the Zoning Enabling Act, because I think Mr. Ward did a great job of answering that. But I also think from a state policy perspective, there's also a role in educating the public. Um, so, so much of what our members face is, is not only zoning blockages, but also the, the classic not in my backyard. You know, some of our housing comes with, with a stigma, unfortunately. And so it's, it's, I think, incumbent upon the state to look at education efforts to, to, to better inform the public about the value of a, of a wide range of housing and different, you know, how housing can help people at different stages in their life. Thank you. Representative Scott. Thank you, Chair. Um, getting back to the manufactured homes, I wasn't aware that the interest rate is much higher than a regular traditional home purchase. Um, how much higher is it? And in a traditional home, you're able to refinance. So I would assume you couldn't do that with a manufactured home, or is that true? Refinancing a chattel loan is, is difficult. There aren't too many um, financial institutions that, that offer a chattel loan and then offer the ability to, to, to refinance that. Um, I, without any data in front of me, mm. um, I can tell you that, that right now, um, for a new manufactured home, you're going to be in the 9 to 10% rate. Hmm. Unfortunately, okay. and then what's the length of the loan? How long is it? Like Average is twenty years. 20 years. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, would you all agree that it, the right right to counsel in housing cases benefits both the tenant and the landlord, and that the tenant does have guidance through the process and somebody in an attorney that can communicate with the landlord? And would you support a broader, more universal uh, right to counsel that both landlords and tenants could utilize? I I think I'd have to see the, the language on, on what we'd be talking about. Um, obviously, you know, there is the ability, there are agencies that help uh, renters uh, through these tough times. Um, you know, it is one of those things uh, where if you do have someone who's not willing to get help, or you know, it, it would depend on how that process really played out um, and, and how that would work. Thank you. Representative Fink. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, my question would, uh, following up on this on this issue of eviction or whatever, you know, in my experience, a landlord usually wants to keep the tenants that they have, uh, presumably because it's less expensive. You know, turnover itself, transactions cost, all of that, uh, that is a problem in and of itself. Is that an accurate way to look at it? Like, the, if you're in, if you're entering into a situation where somebody is not able to pay their rent. What is the landlord's optimal outcome there? Go ahead. Yeah, here, I'll <laughs> switch seats with you. Yeah. Musical chairs. You can go ahead and start. <laughs> Our objective is to always keep the resident in their home. Um, the expense, um, let's say, even if we collected the rent that they owed, the expense of turning the unit, leaving it vacant while we find someone else, it is not, that's not our goal. Our goal is to always keep a resident in the property. Uh, and I'm saying, I'm saying this provided the resident hasn't destroyed the community or there's, you know, uh, committed some sort of criminal act while they're living there. Part of, um, a, a huge part of the problem today, and, and my company, we actually have in-house counsel, so we're, we're at an advantage that many others um, communities are not. But we have in-house counsel, and right now, getting through the court system is absolutely abysmal. We have residents that, by the time they're able to get into court, because there are so many delays, they owe five and six months rent, which they cannot possibly pay because they haven't set the money aside. And it is, it's just a huge, huge problem. You make an important distinction, actually, that I, th I don't think we have, to Rep. Boyer's point, we are we getting into flesh issues out here, but I don't think we've really gotten into this. There, it sounds to me like you're saying there would be a difference in your approach uh, between a non-payment case, which obviously is a, we, we do with a tradition of a seven-day notice to quit, and then you, you go from there. 
and some other kind of a termination case where getting the unit back is the alpha model company. So there's a difference between a simple non-payment case where the tenant is late and other forms of landlord-tenant actions where the unit itself becomes the goal because of the nature of the uh, of the issue you have. Is that, Cor- is that what correct. you're saying? Correct. Uh, termination uh, for cause is um, much less common, but in that case, our goal is to get the unit back and uh, allow that because the other residents are being bothered tremendously at that point. Um, you may have even lost residents. So non, but, but non-payment cases are so slow in Michigan that um, it, it is just, it's become absolutely ridiculous. And again, it doesn't benefit the resident because by the time, they cannot pay the balance by the time they actually get their day in court. And that is unfair to them. Then that, you know, court action gets taken. The landlord doesn't have to turn them over. It's court action that appears on their credit. Um, it, it's it's really become a tremendous problem. It started during COVID, but um, it, it is an issue that has continued and continued. And the courts, and I'm not blaming the courts, they're overwhelmed. We talk to them constantly. Thank you for that, and thank you for those questions, Representative Fink. Um, along the same line of questioning, uh, it's my understanding that once you get beyond two payments behind, once you get to three payments behind, it becomes insurmountable for a tenant to catch up on their payments. But we also know that eviction increases the chances of houselessness significantly. Um, COVID dollars uh, have been used for eviction diversion for the last several years and to help to keep people in houses during the housing crisis. Would you support more assistance to help our tenants catch up on their payments so they can stay in the housing they currently have? Absolutely. The the the, uh, CIRA process was... (laughs) I'm not going to say it wasn't uh, without its pain, but um, it, it, it actually, I would also say we need more education for landlords that are not as large as the company I work for are, so they understand how to assist their residents. But I, I would absolutely, I can speak for the owner of our company, that um, we it, it was a tremendous assistance. We actually hired people in-house in our office to help the residents do the paperwork. Do we have any further questions from members today? Okay. Seeing no additional questions, uh, Representative Stone moves to excuse absent members. There being no objection, the motion prevails by unanimous consent. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm sure that several of us will be in touch as we work through this housing crisis um, and as we pull together our, our bill packages. I really appreciate your time today. There being no no more business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned.